This video is brought to you by BetterHelp. Depending on who you ask, the trolley problem is either the best or worst thought experiments in all of philosophy. For some, it's an incredibly clear way to make the stakes of moral philosophy understandable and practical. For others, it turns ethics into a watered down thought experiment with no basis in reality. Gaining massive popularity with The Good Place, popping up recently in A Knock at the Cabin, and serving as a way of understanding Joel's actions in the season finale of The Last of Us, this thought experiment has become one of the biggest examples of philosophy in popular culture. Now, for those of you who haven't taken Philosophy 101, or for those of you who took it at 9 a.m., the trolley problem is a demonstration of a major philosophical conflict. The one between consequentialist ethics, which aim to maximize pleasure, minimize pain, and prioritize actions that help many people over those that benefit just a few. Your family must choose to willingly sacrifice one of the three of you in order to prevent the apocalypse. And deontological ethics which prioritizes moral duty on the basis of rational deliberation and is more about universal truths than practical applications. Find someone else. There is no one else. We didn't tell her, we didn't cause her any fear. There no. won't be any pain. No, you take me to her, you take me to her right now! There are lots of versions of the problem, but the main gist is something like, imagine there was a trolley headed down a track that was gonna hit a bunch of people and you could switch it to another set of tracks, meaning it would only kill one person. So basically you do nothing, and lots of people don't. Or you switch the tracks and willingly cause one person's death. This can be complicated by asking how this would change if the single person on the tracks was your child or your best friend or Guy Fieri. In which case, the only ethical thing to do will be to let the crowd die to save the Lord of Flavortown. Now, in case you're more of a visual learner, here is an example from The Good Place. I mean, on the one hand, if you ascribe to a purely utilitarian worldview, this problem has recently become less speculative and more practical as designers and programmers making autonomous vehicles consider how these vehicles should behave in a crisis situation. For example, if a self-driving Tesla detects a person at a crosswalk in front of them and determines it doesn't have time to stop, is it better to swerve and hit another car, potentially hurting many, or to simply plow over the one poor soul? Guys, it sucks to say this, but a self-driving car is definitely gonna kill someone at some point because of a programmer's Wikipedia level understanding of ethics. Let's just sit in that for a sec. Okay. But should a classroom example be used to solve actual problems that involve actually existing people? Is this a good example of what ethics is supposed to do? And can it actually teach us anything about the real world? Let's find out in this wisecrack edition on the trolley problem. Are you ready to kill? Okay. Before we get into it, we want to thank this video sponsor, BetterHelp. If you've experienced anxiety, depression, and just felt overwhelmed lately, BetterHelp is a resource that can help you feel better. And I've talked about this before, but I'm someone who struggled a lot with depression in my life and going and seeing a therapist has been a really huge help for me. Um, I kind of wouldn't be at the place I was today without that. So I'm a big fan of seeing a therapist. Now, BetterHelp's network of more than 20,000 therapists are ready to listen to and help you. Now, after you take a brief questionnaire, they'll match you with a therapist whose expertise fits your needs. And thanks to their remote model, you can work with a therapist whose skills might not otherwise be available in your area. You can message them at any time and you'll receive timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule your choice of secure phone or video sessions to receive counseling in real time. And in the event that you and your therapist aren't a perfect match, you can easily switch to a new one for no additional charge. So join more than 2 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with BetterHelp by visiting betterhelp.com slash wisecrack, or you can just click the link in the video description. Now, when you do, you'll get 10% off your first month. So that's betterhelp.com slash wisecrack. And now, back to the show. Now, some philosophers would end the video right now by answering the question, what is the trolley problem good for? With a resounding, absolutely nothing. While not speaking on the trolley problem specifically, in his book, Ethics, philosopher Alain Badiou thinks that examples like the trolley problem are excuses to disengage our own subjectivity from the messy actuality of ethics. For him, all ethical thinking takes place within a situation. So unless you or someone you know has ever been in a position where they've had to push a fat man off a bridge onto train tracks where it killed him but stopped a train from going off a cliff, then honestly, who cares? In other words, you can't do ethics 
hypothetically. And for many others, the trolley problem is actively detrimental in helping us think about actual moral dilemmas. It might even have caught on precisely because it has nothing to do with our actual moral struggles. Even in The Good Place, Michael the Demon enjoys torturing moral philosopher Chidi with the trolley problem because it's so disconnected from real life. And this is particularly painful for someone like Chidi, who died because he couldn't break free from internal deliberation in order to focus on his actual life. You're incapable of making a single decision. Look, I know I can be indecisive, but what's the harm in taking a few extra minutes to find the perfect... I also acknowledge that I just spoiled a plot point of the show The Good Place, but it's been out for a very long time. You've had a good chance to watch it at this point, and honestly, it's a pretty good show, and if that little spoiler ruins your enjoyment of it, I think that's more of a you problem than a me problem. I'm just saying. Writers Adrian Rennix and Nathan J. Robinson discussed this in a 2017 Current Affairs article with the subtle title, The Trolley Problem Will Tell You Nothing Useful About Morality. In it, they argue that if we ended up in a trolley situation in real life, we would panic, do something rashly, and then watch in horror as one or more persons died a gruesome death before our eyes. We would probably end up with PTSD. Whatever we had ended up doing in the moment, we'd probably feel guilty about for the rest of our lives. Even if we had somehow miraculously managed to comply with a consistent set of consequentialist ethics, this would bring us little comfort. In other words, getting an A in ethics class isn't gonna matter after you willfully choose to take the life of another. In other, other words, the trolley problem itself is some real sicko shit. The way it's usually discussed helps disguise this insanity, as it's usually implied that we can make ethical decisions that involve no sacrifices from ourselves, which encourages the idea that ethics involves making functional choices from the sidelines. This also implies that we usually act in situations where we have perfect knowledge of all potential outcomes, when in real life, that's simply not the case. This all assumes a pretty bleak fatalism. Imagining a world where ethical decision-making is about choosing the least worst option among a bunch of bad ones. Bedu refers to this as humanitarian ethics, which he describes as miserable moralism in the name of which we are obliged to accept the prevailing way of the world and its absolute injustice. It also encourages the idea that ethical decisions should be made in some top-down way by benevolent ethical elites, which disguises many of the material power relations that inform how we make ethical and political decisions. And this way, the trolley problem is less about ethics and more about training future technocrats to pick how many of us it's okay to kill with their cool new products. As Rennix and Robinson argue, the trolley problem is repulsive because it encourages people to think about playing God and choosing which people to kill. It warps human moral sensibilities by encouraging us to think about isolated moments of individual choice rather than the context in which those choices occur. It is escapist in that it allows us to comfortably drift into the realm of the implausible and ridiculous so that we do not have to confront disturbing truths about our real world moral failings. If you want to actually be a better person, you can start by never wasting a second of your life contemplating trolley problems. I don't think these guys like it. I'm gonna say that. I don't think they like the trolley problem one bit, you know? I'm not a genius, I'm, I'm good at reading, and I, th I think they don't like it. But before you Google who invented the trolley problem in hopes of sending them hate mail, it's worth noting that this problem was introduced in philosophy in order to make this exact point. It was made famous by Judith Jarvis Thompson in her 1976 paper, Killing, Letting Die, and the Trolley Problem. This paper is what made the trolley problem a thing and led it to becoming a useful trope for lazy professors who want to teach their students that actually ethics is like a video game. It's also worth noting that in a later paper, Thompson imagined a third option with the trolley problem, which was hitting a switch to move the trolley towards yourself. And she concluded that if you're not ready to take yourself out, you can't ethically take anyone else out. I think that seems fair. But Thompson herself took the problem from influential 20th century ethicist, Philippa Foote, and her 1967 paper, The Problem of Abortion and the Doctrine of Double Effect. The Doctrine of Double Effect is a principle used by Catholic philosophers, including Foote's friend Elizabeth Anscombe, to support their view of abortion. The main idea is that there is a distinction between what a man foresees as a result of his voluntary action and what, in the strict sense, he intends. So intentionally performing an abortion aims directly at the termination of the fetus, which for Catholic philosophers equates to murder. But this can be challenged via the thought, well, 
What if the fetus threatens the life of the mother? The Catholic argument here might be that a doctor would not be permitted to give an abortion as it would terminate the fetus, but they would be permitted to perform a hysterectomy on the mother as the death of the fetus here would only be foreseen, not directly intended. They would obviously hope that both mother and baby pull through. Honestly though, this is really complicated, which is why I no longer go to Catholic doctors. Foot disagreed with this argument, but wanted to seriously engage with her friend Anscombe, so her paper thinks about how it would apply in a variety of situations, one of them being the trolley problem. She starts with an example of some potholers who are being led by a fat man out of a cave who then gets stuck trapping them. If you've never heard the term potholers before, it's a British term, which means an explorer of caves or spelunker what a potholer is. I love this word. The cave then starts filling up with water, which risks drowning them all. But one of the potholers has a stick of dynamite, obviously, which they could use to blow up the fat man and get out alive. To be clear, Foote is aware that this is an absurd example. It's intentional. She uses this to show that our intuitions go against the Catholic doctrine of double effect. To blow up the big boy is to kill him. To refuse is to accept the death of everyone and not intended. But it seems permissible to shove that dynamite up his butt and let it rip. To be clear, Foot doesn't suggest butthole dynamite. That's all me. It just seems to make the most sense to put the dynamite up the butthole if you wanted to get just maximum blow upage from the guy, because then it would blow up right in the middle of him. Foot says this example is meant to parallel one where if the fetus isn't aborted, both the fetus and mother would die. Now her next example is a judge faced by rioters demanding that a suspect be found guilty. Otherwise, they'll take their own bloody revenge in a particular part of town, potentially killing tons of people. Now the actual culprit is unknown, so the judge takes it upon themselves to execute an innocent person to avoid a killing spree. Wow, only in a hypothetical example would a judge execute an innocent person because that's never happened in America. Google the Innocence Project, it happens all the time. All the time, innocent people just get put on death row and we're just like, oh, I don't care, I'm busy ordering smoothies on an app that I get points for. This too would be impermissible under the doctrine of double effect because the judge would be intending the death of the innocent person while he'd only foresee the death of the many if he didn't do anything. Foot contrasts this with the trolley problem. Now, we might think that the doctrine of double effect would suggest that you should not switch the track to guide the train towards the one person, which would contrast with the consequentialist view that you should. But while the judge knows he's definitely going to kill one person to save others, Foot is less sure about the trolley problem, writing, in real life, it would hardly ever be certain that the man on the narrow track would be killed. Perhaps he might find a foothold on the side of the tunnel and cling on as the vehicle hurtled by. The driver of the tram does not then leap off and brain him with a crowbar. The judge, however, needs the death of the innocent man for his good purposes. We got a shout out foot here for putting the phrase brain him with a crowbar in an academic paper. You didn't wake up today thinking you were gonna know what a potholer was and that you were gonna hear the phrase brain him with a crowbar and now both those things have happened. Point being, anything's possible. Anything's possible! Basically, Foot uses the trolley problem to emphasize the difficulty and even impossibility of knowing the precise outcome of ethical decisions that take place in the real world. And that in trying to boil down complex ethical decisions to thought experiments, we often miss the point about how unlike a thought experiment the world actually is. It shouldn't surprise us that this was the initial intent of the trolley problem once we consider that Foote was one of the most important figures in the development of modern virtue ethics. A position that grew out of a frustration with the either or between consequentialism and deontology that's often exemplified by the contemporary usage of the trolley problem. This led philosophers like Foote back to an Aristotelian version of ethics to try to make sense of how acting well is part of living well. As a particular kind of animal, Aristotle considered humans to be rational animals, is associated with a particular kind of good, in this case, human flourishing. For Aristotle and virtue ethicists, we make ethical decisions not as gods, but as specific human individuals in specific situations who have to make sacrifices to do the right thing, who can be limited by structural and material factors, and who are often ignorant to the outcomes of their actions. So to reply to Renix and Robinson, it is of course wildly misleading when the trolley problem is taught without taking all of these glaring problems into consideration. But it's equally important to remember that the trolley problem was originally devised as a lighthearted and slightly sardonic way of showing the importance of doing exactly this. Because in a life or death trolley problem situation, 
action. Which to be clear, we are all very unlikely to ever experience, fingers crossed. The best actions might still have incredibly horrible consequences. Even if we would of course never intend them and would actively hope they would not happen. You're in a boat next to a volcano and you can either save 50 people or one awesome dog. Ultimately, ethics can't rely on calculations about what might or might not happen in an imagined future. But instead, at least for foot, should be grounded in an attempt to live and act virtuously. This entails analyzing situations from within and acting in accordance with virtue, even when we don't really know what might or might not happen. Well, this might not be as much fun as imagining all the different ways we could run over people with trolleys or how much dynamite you need to stick up a large man's butt to blow him up. It's much more useful in trying to think about how to ethically exist in our actual world. But what do you guys think? Is there still a place for the trolley problem in the philosophy 101 classes of the world? Is it too abstract to help us think ethically? Or might it be incredibly useful in showing us what ethics is not? Let us know in the comments. A huge shout out to our virtuous patrons who support our channel directly and in exchange, get the videos early without ads, along with extra audio and video content. And they get to jump on our Discord server. What fun. If any of this sounds good to you, there's a link in the description. I encourage you to check it out. But thank you so much for watching our videos, for liking, subscribing, commenting, sharing, all those things. They all help us out and it means a lot. And in the meantime, if you see any runaway trolleys in your town, just walk the other way. You don't want to be involved, I promise. And we'll see you next time.